I'll try not to be too technical, I promise. Uh, and don't be scared by the fact that I'm using slides and by, by the fact that I'm going to talk about logic uh, or in general about formal methods, so mathematics. Um, I think I'll just want to tell you a little bit about the research that we do at King's, but also try to be more general, so not just be limited at what we do at King's in computer science. And actually, I know that there are a number of people here uh, in Sydney and in Phoenix and throughout the world who are carrying out very similar research to the one that I'm going to talk about today. And in particular, I want to focus on two aspects of the cybersecurity issue. One of them is the human dimension. Sorry, uh, well, I'll try not to point because the the angle is not very favorable. So how can we actually incorporate reasoning about humans from the point of view of a computer scientist? So I'm not going to be presumptuous and talk about social scientists or uh, social sciences or, or policies or politics in general, but also how we can use mathematics to come up with results that are very interesting, but also where the boundaries are. Now. Uh, I'm going to touch upon what Jacinta already introduced, namely the fact that in the last 40 years or so, we have witnessed a revolution. The fact that this revolution hasn't been so bloody yet as many of the other revolutions have been in the past is simply because it is a digital revolution. And the fact that nowadays people have access to information, have access to ways of communicating that didn't exist before. And here I just listed you know, some of our basic infrastructures, which are networked. And more and more are coming. So that basically, you, know, you could be sitting at Kuji Beach or Bondi Beach or somewhere nice, and at the same time voting, or maybe doing your banking, or accessing some data on the cloud somewhere. Maybe social, uh, social media, Facebook, Twitter, as we heard before. Or you could try and control some cars and use this as a means to prevent accidents or actually to cause them. Or you could try to reboot a plane while it's flying, which is possible, by the way. Um, and actually, there is a lot of research in trying to take control of a plane while it is flying, for instance, because it has been hijacked and you want to actually regain control of the plane. But like all these issues, like Jacinta was mentioning in her talk before, very, very interesting talk, by the way, uh, all these things come with another side of the coin, namely the fact that they could be misused to provoke harm, to cause damage, to kill people, to actually endanger our infrastructures. So we have to take all these things actually quite seriously and try to reason about the products that we set out there and the users. So I'm not going to take a standard point of view of a computer scientist, which is normally taking the point of view of an attacker, of a hacker, or of somebody trying to subvert the system. But I'm going to consider uh, two other kinds of people, namely the developers of the systems and the users, and try to see what we can do for them. Now, keeping in mind, of course, that this is going to be a crucial factor, and in particular, a factor that is both enabling, so allowing us to improve the state of the world, of course, but also disabling. Okay. Now, coming from London, I think I felt I couldn't give it, well, I'm Italian, as you probably hear from my accent, but I've been living in London for, uh, for four years now, and I thought, well, one can't really give a talk without pushing in Shakespeare at some point. And actually, this is the only use of the word security in any of Shakespeare's work. And it's uh, Hecate's monologue, so the queen of the witches. Um, and at some point, she actually, so in, in the Scottish play, uh, Macbeth, XC3, scene, five, three, uh, scene five, she actually says, well, security is mortal's chiefest enemy. I'm a computer scientist, I'm also a playwright, so I find this particularly very interesting. And if you think about it, and if you actually talk to somebody uh, studying theater, uh, or in general studying the, the Renaissance and the period of Shakespeare, you will actually find out that the use of the word security that Shakespeare does is actually quite different from the one that we are used to today. Because he actually talks about security in terms of confidence. 
and in this case, overconfidence. So what I thought it interesting is that, well, actually looking at it from the point of view of the Global Security Plus, which is an initiative we bring, which brings together people from very, very different areas. You know, the, the nerds like me, uh, so mathematicians, computer scientists, uh, ranging to uh, people working in policies, to people working in health, to uh, uh, terrorism, counterterrorism, violent war, conflict, and everything. Well, actually, let's, let's look at it from the human point of view. And let's consider the fact that, you know, actually, if we're honest, security, so achieving proper security, is actually tedious and in, in some cases even expensive or difficult or even impossible. And this is a, you know, a stance that could be summarized with a slogan that breaches wi will occur, which from the point of view of psychologists is kind of a form of Nietzsche's Turkish fatalism. So basically my computer cannot be protected, so why should I worry? Why should I actually encrypt my data? Why should I use file vault to encrypt my, the data on my computer or, or any other application? People are going to be able to hack, on, hack it anyway, so why should I bother? And alternatively, and actually, sorry, I thought it's early morning, and if, like me, you're jet lagged, you might need a cartoon. This is just saying you're insecure because your data is unsecured. Uh, or, you know, you could take another point of view, which is connecting with the cat is monologue. So overconfidence is mortal chief, and that's the chiefest enemy. Sorry, I'm really jet lagged. Uh, Taking the point of view, you no, know, it won't happen to me. Yes, of course, they're going to steal somebody's identity on, on Facebook or a bank account. But actually, you know, it, it won't happen to me. Why should they attack me? Which is kind of a form of Freud's fictions of omnipotence. So my computer needs no protection. And if you look at these two points of views from the point of view of actually somebody working in computer security, this is a nightmare, right? So we will never win. Right? On one hand, we have people who tell who stand take the point of view, well, my computer cannot be protected, so why should I bother? Why should we bother developing solutions? Or my computer needs no protection, again, which is completely bypassing what we want to do. And actually, history is full of examples of security breaches due to poor security screening. This is the eponymous Trojan horse, so the real one. And this is a great moment in security screening. This is somebody turning around and saying Gesundheit, which is German for bless you, because somebody apparently sneezed inside the horse, which is a very bad example of, <laughs> of security screening, right? So what can we do from the point of view of a computer scientist? Well, try to make it real. And there are three very, very, very recent examples. I mean, you might have heard of Heartbleed, uh, an attack on, on actually a vulnerability, a bug in uh, some crypto libraries uh, about a year ago, about a couple of years ago. And I won't go into the details because it would become a slightly too technical. But it does, of course, uh, it did, of course, create a number of problems. You have heard of WannaCry, so the ransomware attack. It was actually mentioned also in, in, in the introduction by Professor Boyle. And also, this I've been told is very, very real for all you here. Uh, about a week old, so the, the breach on Medicare and the fact that the information is sold on the dark web. Now, I'm not going to talk about this. Uh, it would be fascinating to talk about the dark web, but I'm not really an expert of that, so I don't want to risk saying stupid things. But let me try and tell you a little bit what we can do and what we still need to work on in order to be able to do it. Okay. Now, if we look at the point of view of breaches will occur, the answer from a computer science point of view is basically, well, you know, the only secure computer is isolated, so unplugged from the web uh, or from the net, uh, be it wired or wireless. And actually, please turn it also off, because there are a number of ways of getting the data that is on your computer without you having a connection to the internet. So one can use, you know, microphones with, or, or uh, um, binoculars. Well complex binoculars that you can buy actually for about $50 and read everything that is on the computer in the back row down there by looking at the reflection on your glasses or by, looking at, uh, by hearing in on the sound that you make when you type the different keys. So we must accept the fact that security doesn't really exist, at least 100% security. We can make it more difficult. We can make it more expensive. We can make it more time consuming to actually get access to the data. And that is the whole point, right? So trying to make it 
more expensive to attack a system than what you actually gain from the data that you attacked. Now, I'm not going into the politics of all this. I'm not going into the fact whether it's good or bad that some end-to-end -end encryption exists and messaging. We could have a debate there, but uh, I'm just going to focus more on the technical point of view. And actually talk about the second solution, which is the one that I and a number of other people have been working on. Namely, instead of saying to, to our fellow uh, users uh, to turn off their computers, well, can we actually provide them with guarantees, with proofs? Sorry, this is Microsoft taking revenge on me and as a Mac <laughs> user and cutting, uh, cutting my nice pictures. Uh, well, it's supposed to be a fence but, uh, or a castle, but yeah and actually use mathematics to come up with proofs of the security of a system or disproofs, namely the fact that a system is not secure. Now, this is difficult. Again, I'm not going to go into the details. I'm just going to tell you the ideas and a couple of examples of why it is interesting to do that. So actually going out and as an evangelist, as a security evangelist, and tell people, well, actually, yes, breaches will occur, and they will happen to you. But there are solutions out there. Now, of course, and this is interesting, perhaps, for those of you coming from the uh, industrial, uh, industrial area, well, of course, they are expensive. Right? There is no free lunch. And the trick is to try to make them less expensive, and, or at least, not as expensive as an attack would be. Okay. Now, what are formal methods? Uh, this is small. It's not really meant to be read. But basically, formal methods are techniques and tools based on mathematics and logics, as Vinita was mentioning in, in her introduction. So trying to come up with mathematical models of our systems and mathematical proofs of the security or the non-security of our systems. Now, the beauty of uh, mathematics is that it is not up for debate. You know, uh, Jacinta was mentioning before the, the need for scientists to reach out and, and to convince people that science and expertise are actually a good thing. I recently read a very, very nice book called The Death of Expertise. And it mentioned a couple of things, you know, like something, the speed of light is not up for debate. I mean, it's, it's a fact. Uh, and the same could be said for vaccines and everything. But again, that's more a political discussion. But the same situation can happen here. So we can come up with proofs. Now, let me give you one very quick example. Imagine you're really sitting there at Kuji Beach or Bondi Beach, and you're doing shopping. I just picked Amazon because the logo was available, but pick your favorite retailer or whatever. OK, now, of course, what you are establishing is a connection, right? Not physical, but a virtual connection. And the way it works is, well, you actually want to make sure that bad guys here, the pirates, are not really able to intercept your connection because they might want to intercept your data, to read your credit card, or, or, or cause harm in general. Excuse me. So how can, what can we do? Well, we can actually encrypt the communication, which basically means protecting it in such a way that if an attacker tries to attack it, it won't succeed. Now, this is done through security protocols. And I just thought I'd mention something for curiosity. In case you're interested, you might have, mentioned, you might have noticed that when you actually type in a, a URL, so a uniform resource locator on the web, it often has an S here. This S stands for secure. So it should be a secure connection, unless there is heartbleed and a couple of other problems. But it's basically a protocol that establishes a connection between a client, in this case, and some server, some machine, and encrypts the data. Now, this is called a security protocol. And what I've been working on for the last, well, gosh, almost 20 years now is coming up with a formal, formal way to analyze the security of security protocols. And actually, we all do that. We all use security protocols without really noticing. And, and this is particularly interesting because um, it is part of this evangelical action of trying to, to inform people about the fact that we actually are all using these technologies. For instance, 
whenever we access some prototyping services on the web, and here it could be you know, a bank, or Google, or, or King's College, or Vodafone, or, or, a play, or booking a plane of Lufthansa, well, we all have to remember username and password. And this is fine from a technological point of view. I mean, you know, we're asking the user to remember two things, like the username, which is typically their name or their email address, so it shouldn't be too difficult to remember, and then a password. And we want this password, of course, to be good, to be resistant to attacks. Great, but if we actually consider the fact that we are asking our users to remember a large number of passwords, and they should be long, and they should be difficult, because they should include alphanumeric characters, and uh, small and uppercase letters, and, and maybe some symbols, actually users will find a way. I mean, users are like you know, raindrops on, on, a glass wall, on a glass. They, f they search, or electrons, they search for the path of least resistance. They search for the easiest solution. And Typically, what they'll do is they'll come up with ways of remembering the different passwords, which are use always the same one, rotate different ones. This is a printer at King's. You can't really say, but it says username and password 1890, <laughs> which is kind of defeating the purpose, right? So if you have a username and password, you shouldn't make it public. But this is what typically happens. And here, I mean, here are some statistics, you know, uh, and again, uh, statistics are just information, but you know, 35% of people use the same password, 60% of people cycle two passwords, 70% have forgotten a password, and then people use post-it, people use familiar names, which defeats the purpose, right? So what, what can computer scientists do? Well, we can develop solutions. And let me give an example. You will hear later talks about from the medical domain. Let me give an example from a medical domain of our security protocol called single sign-on that we have all been using can actually help. So imagine the following situation. You have a doctor who comes in in the morning. And here I'm talking about Google because it's an attack that we carried out a, a few years ago. But the doctor in the morning has to log in on, on Google, then has to log in on some medical insurance, perhaps, and other healthcare services, and has to remember a large number of username and passwords. This is very cumbersome. The doctor will find a way to, to alleviate the problem. The solution will actually make the system less secure. So what can we do? Well, we can actually introduce some angelical entity, I mean, some entity that we all accept as good. And in this case, you know, it could be just the hospital. And the hospital has a contract, really a proper contract, with the Google, Google, with the medical insurance, and the other healthcare services that recognize the hospital's authority. <coughs> this is not different whenever, every time we cross a border. Why, why are we allowed to cross a border? Because we have some passport which has been issued by a government, and other governments recognize the authority of that government, of our own, right? And they let us through. So single sign-on is a protocol that simply allows you to log in to your identity provider, and by doing that, magically open all the other locks. Now, I mentioned we all use this. Well, how many times have you been asked, well, log in uh, using your username and password, or your Facebook, Google, uh, Yahoo account, right? This is single sign-on. These are your providers. You don't have to remember yet another pair of username and passwords. You can just use the ones of the identity providers that you accept. Great. It's a protocol. It works. Perfect. We are using it. Is it secure? Well, it depends. And it depends because one of the problems of the internet, and Jacinta was mentioning it actually before, is that you're not really sure with whom you're talking, right? And given that I'm showing you cartoons, let me show you perhaps the most famous one about the internet. It's on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, which is about 20 years old. And this is the updated version. I am one of your Facebook friends. <laughs> and, and this is true, right? So we don't know with whom we are communicating. So people like me, who come up with formal models, so mathematical models of the protocols, also try to come up with models of our attackers, right? Assuming, actually, that we don't know with whom we are communicating. That's the whole point. If we knew that, if I knew that I was really talking to my bank, I wouldn't need encryption. 
I already know I'm talking to my bank. But I need encryption because I'm not sure that I'm talking to my bank. It could be somebody telling me, yes, of course, I'm your bank, I'm Barclays. And yes, of course, tell me the, the, the details of your bank account and your PIN and password and everything, right? So what did we do? So Google was actually, and I'm talking about Google to praise Google. It do sound a little bit like uh, Mark Anthony in, in Shakespeare's Caesar now. I'm not, <laughs> but, but sorry. Um, so, but the same problem that I'm going to present was suffered by Microsoft and other companies. And actually, Google put the code online so that we could analyze, and the other companies didn't. So we actually took the version of single sign-on that Google was selling a while ago for uh, $10 a piece. But that sold millions. So you can do the math. And we thought, well, what happens you know, if some of the players in this picture are actually bad guys? Can something happen? And we developed a tool, OK, I'm going to skip this. And we actually jumped from the real world to an abstract, to a formal model. And we came up with a formalization, pushed a button with our tool, and actually found an attack that we were able to reproduce for real. And we actually told Google, and they said, no, it's impossible. And we told them, no, we did it for real. They said, no, we don't believe it. And we said, no, no, we did it. We bought your service, and we attacked ourselves. We have a video on YouTube that proves it. So uh, well, we, it wasn't on YouTube then. We told them, and they fixed it. And, and, and we, got, uh, we got recognition, and it's great, showing you know, that not all the hackers are bad guys uh, in some sense. How did we do it? Well, I'm going to skip the math. I'm just going to tell you. <laughs> the idea behind it. So basically, the protocol worked as follows. right? You have your client, you have your service that you want to access, and you have your hospital, which is the identity provider. And basically, what happens, these are messages being sent back and forth. Don't worry if you don't understand them. I'm not going to go into the details. But basically, what is happening here, at some point, the service provider asks the client to provide the certificate. Right? Which is basically what happens at every border, as I was mentioning before. When you want to enter a country, they tell you, Prove to me that you're allowed to enter, and you produce a certificate. And this is actually what is being asked here. It's an authentication assertion, which is basically then signed here with the digital signature by the hospital, saying, I, the hospital, certify that this client is indeed the doctor and is allowed to access the service. Now, this seems fine. And indeed, you can prove that this is secure. However, similar to Heartbleed, similar to the, to the problems that I mentioned before, these protocols are implemented by humans. And humans have actually many other, by engineers or computer scientists, and they have other pressures. And one of the pressure, or one of the things that they were asked to do, is to make sure that this was quick. Now, encryption, for those of you who are familiar with it, is complex. For those of you who are not, you imagine uh, you have to encrypt some data, so it will take some time to encrypt it and decrypt it. So what they thought is, well, let's try to simplify the message, and let's remove some fields. So let's remove some areas here. And you know, the, the shorter the message, the less you have to encrypt, the quicker it will be. Now, it turned out that actually, uh, and I'm going to skip the video because I don't have the time. But actually, what they reconstructed was something that some of you might be familiar with from uh, The Three Musketeers or from Casablanca, the movie. Basically, they created a carte blanche. Because what they were signing here is a certificate saying, whoever holds this is the doctor signed the identity provider. Okay. So, what we found out is that the service provider here, the medical insurance, could actually take the certificate, go to another service provider, and say, I'm, I'm the doctor. Here is a document that proves it signed the hospital. Okay. And this is the attack that we carried out. It's basically launching two sessions in parallel. And as I mentioned, if you're familiar with the 1941 Casablanca movie, Humphrey, uh, Michael Curtis, Humphrey Bogart, Ingrid Bergman, the whole movie revolves around some letters of transit which the Nazis will accept, allowing people to board a plane in Lisbon and, uh, well, Morocco, fly to Lisbon and then to the US. And the whole movie revolves around this fact that the, the letters are empty. So you can write your name on them, which is 
a crazy if you think about it in terms of dramatical plot. I mean, why, why, why would somebody accept it? But you believe it because it's such a good movie, right? But it's the same thing here, and it's the same thing in The Three Musketeers. You have this letter saying, whoever holds this is the doctor. Right? And this is a mistake that engineers did. And it did create a lot of problems, and we carried out an attack. And there are a number of things that we can do to help them. Because actually, I mean, these people are not crazy. They, they looked at the protocols, and they tried to check that they were secure. And they thought they were secure. But the fact that we came up with a mathematical model and with tools to reason about them allowed us to find attacks. Now, of course, and I'm skipping a few. Sorry, I have many more slides because I thought in case there are questions. Of course, this is complex. But the more we can do to integrate it into industry, and actually, we, if we found this attack in the context of a project, and the tool that we developed is now integrated in SAP, Siemens, and to some extent in IBM, the better. But there are challenges. I mean, it's difficult. And let me skip, as I said, a lot of slides. Uh, in case there are questions, I can show them later on, and I'm happy to, pro uh, to provide them in order to actually help people develop these tools. And let me conclude, actually, by saying you know, formal methods, like the small examples that I showed to you, can really make a difference. As I mentioned, it's not that the engineers of Google or, or Microsoft were, were stupid. They were doing their best. They just had not thought about all the different possibilities. But that's what tools are for, to think about what humans can't really think about if they are good tools, of course, and if they're mathematical models that can capture all the eventualities. Okay. And we do have a number of tools. Two of them I helped develop. They're here, but there are plenty more. And by th actually, these are a few years old. And by now, they're outdated. There are other concurrent tools which are much better than ours. But what are the challenges that we are facing now? Well, you know, right now, we can reason quite well about security protocols, single sign-on, hardly, the, the TLS and everything. We can reason about that. But there are two other components, and this concludes my talk going back to initial, that we need to think about. We, we have to stop thinking, and this is a problem for us computer scientists, about systems as technical systems. You know, It's a program. We can think about it. Well, no, it's a program that is being executed by humans. So we need to think about the humans. And humans are not always the weakest link in the loop. Of course, they typically are, but not always. But we must consider the fact that you know, users may perceive security as a burden. Think about the passwords. So they will find ways either to ignore it or to bypass it. So the challenge for us is to develop systems that are not a burden for the user, but are secure, which is very, very difficult to do, let me tell you. Moreover, there is a huge leap that we have to do now from systems to cyber physical systems. Because nowadays, most of our infrastructures are governed by protocols, by security protocols, by machines, by computers. All our nuclear power plants, all the water power plants, energy, infrastructure, transport, they're all controlled by programs. And they can be very easily attacked. Now, reasoning about this opens up a totally new dimension for people like me, because suddenly you don't have to think about only cryptography, but you have to think about the different components. And for those of you who are a bit more nerdy, you don't have to think about logics, but you have to think about differential equations, which is just difficult in terms of models. Okay? So these are the new frontiers. This is where we hope Global Security Plus will help. And actually, let me conclude with a positive message. You know, One of the beautiful things about security and about our initiative is the fact that it's called global security. And this is a very, very strong scientific message because it, uh, it highlights the interdisciplinarity of it. And I mean, you heard, just heard a computer scientist speak. Uh, uh, we heard about counterterrorism. We have talk, talks about uh, conflict and data and health and disasters. But it's also a very strong political statement. Because if we really want to achieve security, we should not do it by isolating ourselves, by leaving unions or raising walls. And sorry if I'm being very political in this, but I'm talking about Brexit and, and the Trump administration, of course. But actually by joining forces to, uh, to achieve security together. Otherwise, it simply won't work. It will be a totally false security, even from the point of view of a computer scientist. So thanks a lot. I'm sorry I took a couple more minutes.